been working on next level of integration of the clinical theory. Uh, we're looking at the, the fivefold symmetry of the universe is a, is a fundamental that, that, that shows up throughout the model. Uh, the, the dodecahedron as the fifth and final of the, uh, the platonic solids, which are uniquely symmetrical uh, solid structures in three-dimensional space. And so the, the, the dodecahedron being made up of five-sided uh, pentagonal figures, 12 of them with 20, with 20 corners, 20 vertices. And uh, so the, I'm looking at, there, there's every, every different perspective we take, we, we can look at the, the universe from whatever perspective we want to look at, from consciousness, from energy, from material substance, from information, uh, you know, le electromagnetism, energy. And so each of those is a valid, perfectly valid perspective, but we're looking for a meta perspective that, that includes all of those in, in a natural order, a natural sequence that's, that, that flows for our minds to be able to, to, to grasp the, the relationships between these different perspectives and how they all integrate and function together. So, so clinically, we can look at, at a perspective of, say, starting with structure, which is you know, our most familiar sensory uh, you know, way of grasping the universe. We have this body structure that we deal with you know, from internal experience and, and externally you know, healing um, and the physical damage and trauma that might happen to that broken bone, for example. So we know that, you know, when that bone breaks, there's, there's lots going on besides that physical disruption of the structure. It's certainly affecting energy flows, it's affecting the fluid dynamics, it's affecting the ability to get nutrients to the cells, it's affecting the information flow in, in the nerves, there's pain, there's which is pain in oriental medicine is considered a disruption, a blockage of the energy flow. So, so again, all of these, even if we're coming from one perspective, like say structure, we still need to c complete our, our thinking to address that structural issue on all of the, the levels, on a level of, of function, you know, is, is it a green stick fracture and the, and the, the arm is still functioning? Uh, or is there disruption in function? Is it, is it a compound fracture and bones are out of place? Maybe there's damage to vessels and nerves, to neurovascular bundles. Uh, so, so structure, function, the, the energy, which is uh, like in the nerve flow, that's electronic energy, movement of ions that carry charge, charge particles flowing in the, in the plasma. Uh, intracellular, extracellular of the body as, as the ions move. That's actually electrical current, which creates magnetic fields. Magnetic fields also induce current. So there's a, a, an interaction. We know the three-hand rule in, in physics of, of the, the three, how we see in, in the uh, clinical theory, how the spatial dimensions come about, we believe, is through electromagnetism. The fact that movement and electricity and magnetism are three orthogonal or at right angles to each other dimensions and therefore we have three dimensionality of space. Well, we have a symmetry to that in time and that time is also in a very real sense three dimensional. We think of it as linear and one dimensional because of our, our developmental experience in time here. But in fact, the present moment, the now, is a particular dimension of time that's really one-pointed. It's a point in time. And, and the uh, Russian research into, into uh, 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 torsion physics, vortex physics, and everything is a vortex, including time in our model, the, is that uh, there is absolute coherence through the universe. There is a now. There is a universal now, time. So this time now is happening everywhere in the universe at the same time. And there's consciousness, there's universal consciousness, there's informational awareness, there's informational signaling happening in real time, independent, completely independent of, of, of distance, of space. And uh, the Russians showed this with, with uh, research on the sun, very large, uh, powerful 
uh, object to get a signal from, so that's where they, where they looked, pointed, pointed a telescope, blocked out all light energy, all electromagnetic energy from coming through, and they were still able to get not one, but three images of the sun. One where the sun is seen in the sky, which that's easy, you take the, 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 the shield off and you can take a beautiful photograph of, of the sun. Uh, but the other two images inform us that time is also three-dimensional. One of those images was an image of the sun where it actually is now in the sky, not where we see it. We see where the sun was eight minutes ago when those electromagnetic waves, when those photons of light that we see with our, our visual apparatus that we receive, when those energy waves left the sun, that's where the sun was. We see it where it was. It's, the wave is taking time to progress and come to us. And they also, so they saw an image where the sun actually is in real time, which we can't see it there with our, our external eyes. Uh, they also got a third image that was where the sun will be in eight minutes, approximately, when, it, when if, if uh, a waveform, electromagnetic waveform, traveling in reverse time were coming from the sun, it would be coming from that future position to the front of, of the sun and arriving here now. So these three dimensions of time are are all happening at the same time, just <laughs> they're all, the languaging gets confusing, right? Because our language is a linear temporal progression of words that code for concepts and relate to our temporal experience of the ego, of ego time, of forward moving time. But uh, we have to envision these three aspects of time, of, of now, the absolute now, which is ever progressing, of course, but it's a point in time. The past, which we, what we have access to in the past is, is a linear progression of time. That's the arrow of time, is the past time. It's two-dimensional. I'm sorry, it's one-dimensional rather than, than say, zero dimension of, of, of now, the moment of now. It's like a point, like zero dimensions. It has spatial extent, has universal extent, but Okay, so, so past we can think of as a line, linear time, and the future, the future has possibilities. There's more than one line. We can make choice. How do we have free choice? Because future time we're navigating into, and we can, by our virtue of our cellularity, of, of, of self-organizing structure and function and energy and information and consciousness, spirit, by being independent spirits within, part of, and therefore dependent, but interdependent, with this universe of spirit that we are part of, that we are cells of, we can navigate into that future realm of possible time scenarios and choose path A or path B. This is the fundamental of the water element. Okay, the you know the kidney bladder uh, water element, those meridians. Uh, we, we envision being a center down in this area, uh, the the third chakra area more or less corresponds to the actual physical location of the, of the kidneys in the back here, the thoracic area. And uh, so it's part of the progression of the five elements in this circle in the, five, in the uh, clinical theory of everything. So it's, it's the first, second, third, fourth of the five elements in, in, as described in, in, uh, in Oriental medicine, Oriental philosophy, uh, Taoist uh, uh, exploration of the of, Beyond the yin yang cycle, within that yin yang cycle, within the two, there's the five. That was in you know ancient times, five thousand years ago. Uh, you know, looking at, looking more deeply into understanding of the nature of things. Beyond the two, was the this came this essence of the five, and, and many other cultures also came up with five elements. Sometimes four, but often five. Most often five. And, and today we have five, five elements of nature, in a sense, in, in the quintessence, what's called the quintessence in modern physics, where we have now trying to understand the universe. Again, whatever perspective we take is a perspective. The universe is what it is, and it's multifaceted. And however, you know, 
seek and you'll find. Look for the truth and you uncover the truth. You know, if you're a geologist, you see it in the rocks. And if you're a biologist, botanist, you see it in the plants. And if you're a psychologist, you see it in, in, in thinking and awareness and emotions. So it's, it is everywhere. And this was the nature of, of, uh, of traditional Chinese medicine, oriental medicine, and, and the five element philosophy. So, uh, so, so with future time, we have, we have the equivalent of a, of a computer chip. We have a two-dimensional space, which is capable of, of processing more information, not just holding memory of, of a timeline like, like, like the past, which is all the ego knows, but the being present in the moment, we can draw on that past information and knowledge, but we're navigating the future, which has possibilities. In theory, uh, and, and any theory is, is unprovable, every theory is unprovable, theories are, are useful or not useful. They can be disproven, but never proven. Uh, but so we can contemplate in theory that, that, that all possibilities that are possible actually exist. That, that this point of now is the movement through those infinite possibilities. And so this is how we explain miracles of healing in that the, the timeline, the past that we experience, that we've arrived here from, is not the only possible past. It's just the one that, that we are part of. It's, you know, it's the vine that, that, that I, as a leaf or a fruit or a flower, am attached to. But yet there's these things we call miracles. And how does that happen? How does a person with no eye have an eye instantaneously that's their own eye? It's not transplanted. It's not grown. It doesn't grow uh, like, like, uh, like the body grows in, in the womb or, or like, even like healing, like granulation tissue. It's not one cell from another. It's, it's perfectly formed cellular tissue that's age appropriate to that person even though they lost their eye 30 years before. So where did it age? How did it age? What, it happened in a complete universe, on another, in this complete, complete, complete universe, on another timeline that we don't have access to. Just like we can only see the Hubble sphere. Actually, the Hubble sphere is the definition of the extent of your and my cellularity as a being in this infinite universe. We exist not only in this biological anchor here on Earth, but we exist energetically throughout the universe that we can see, and that's the Hubble sphere. Just as we exist to as small of a, a space as we can image and contemplate, and, and that's the, the Planck scale, of where we propose that the Planck scale is made up of these dode dodecahedral functional units. So, so we have the structure, we have the function of the structure, we have the energetics is flowing through that that determines the, the changes in chemistry, the, you know, whether something heals or degenerates, is, is determined by the, the material of the chemistry, the energetics of the electrons that make and break bonds, like oxidation or reduction or, or uh, building up tissue, uh, anabolism versus catabolism of detoxification and breaking down. You know, we break down food that's, let's say, proteins. These are linear chains, like the past. They're, they're made in the past by some other organism. And now we're gonna, in the present now, we're gonna digest them, break them into little moments of now of, of amino acids that we can, can put back together, or tripeptides that code, uh, uh, tripeptides that will code, for example, in signaling in the body for regeneration of a particular organ or another. So we break them down into these functional units and then string them back together according to our own programming, our own genetic uh, code will determine the enzymes, but it's also in our environment and the signaling, the information, the light energy, the resonance from that cellular environment that determines which genes are turned on and turned off. So which enzymes we're gonna make depends on the food we eat, it depends on digestion, so our state of our organs, are we able to digest? What's our state of, of parasympathetic relaxation ability to digest versus stress and shutting that system down. What's our absorption and, and uh, nourishment through the uh, supplying the nutrients to the cells through the, the blood supply and through the extracellular space 
For example, in, in our culture, we, uh, on average, people eat four to five times more protein than we need to repair and replace those enzymes and, and, and structural uh, proteins. And therefore, we deposit this extra protein in that connective tissue matrix, which is like the filter through which all the nourishment and detoxification comes and goes to the cell. And so as that gets blocked up, the cell can no longer receive full nourishment. We're over, overfed yet undernourished, just as our cells are. It's why we have so much obesity. We, when we're undernourished, our body stores energy. It says, hey, we're, we're starving. We're starving for the, the vitamins, the minerals, the actual, the most critical nutrients. You know, the, 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 the energy calories is, is really the least critical. People who live the longest, when we study them, there's a whole group of people who live the longest who've actually been, been underfed for years during uh, times of war and famine where there's not enough calories, the mitochondria in our cells adapt and make more mitochondria and we, our energy metabolism becomes much more efficient. So we're, we're made to adapt to ra radical changes, to, to even do really well with radical seasonal changes and availability of food. Imagine if you're eating, as our ancestors did, in a natural environment, things are in, in season, then they're not in season. There's you know a time uh, for you know foraging certain foods or digging certain roots or planting or harvesting or hunting, and so all these cyclic changes in in our current earthly cosmology were adapted for that. Although we are also apparently adapted for a heaven on earth type of cosmology, which uh, the electric universe model that we ad ad adapt and adopt. Uh, recalls from our ancient history of all of our tribal ancestors around the globe, recorded in rock, like written in stone, written on stone, with petroglyphs, how the, the plasmoids in the cosmos were, were seen and recorded the same everywhere around the planet at the same time, thousands of years ago, maybe 6,000 plus years ago. And, and we see from the geological record that actually, for maybe 90% of Earth's history, most of Earth's history, and, and uh, especially in, in very ancient history, as our, our, the genetics of life were evolving on Earth, but even 80, 90 percent of, of recent history, recent meaning you know, past few million years, that most of the time the Earth is not the way that we know it now, that the seasons changing so radically was not a common uh, factor in our genetic evolution, even though we are adapted to, to, to uh, epigenetically respond to these challenging times, we are also adapted for living peacefully with different species in the same environment without having to eat each other by actually uh, living as we've proven now that, that some bacterial species can in the laboratory live on the energy fields alone. The Earth's temperature normally is 70 degrees to the North and South Pole, speaking geologically. And we know from the geological record that, that, that the Earth shows a history of what's called punctuated equilibrium, where so for, for long periods of time, the Earth is in this stable configuration with the planets lined up and, and Earth in a field that's nourishing to, directly to ourselves through energy, as again, certain bacterial species have now recently been absolutely proven to be able to survive and thrive without any physical material nourishment. So we're made that way as well. We have that potential when the environment is conducive to that. So there's more than, than those, those, those three first parts that we can measure with our materialistic science. We have a machine and, we, and wires and electricity and lenses and you know, chemicals and we can measure things and we can control them and change them and manipulate them with our hands and our mind, through our minds operating through our hands. That takes us so far. It takes us to being able to work with, you know, the, the, the gross material substance, yes, the, the protons, the matter, the mass. And, and then on a more subtle level, we get, you know, go from that purely mechanical age to the electro electronic age, and we can manipulate electrons, and electricity, energy, electromagnetic fields. No, we're in the midst of all that now. We're filling the electromagnetic spectrum with all of our devices and communication and, you know, microwave ovens and you name it. 
and irradiating ourselves indiscriminately across the spectrum. And some of those frequencies are very detrimental and some are very beneficial and we have no clue which is which. So potentially we can produce technology that utilizes the beneficial bands of frequency and actually increase harmony in our environment by using technology. That's where we need to, to, to step into next. But right now we're, we're just, it's there, use it, we can make money, whatever that is. Oh, money is gold, we can t steal the gold and still make money and pretend that it's something and control the people and control minds and spirits and suck the life energy from others. So that's what commerce is, that's what war is. It's the concept that we can take something that's common in one place, move it across the sea to a place where it's rare and extract the life energy of the people who, to whom that substance is rare. And, and that's, that's where the, the, the oldest written law, the law of Hammurabi, which is the law of the sea, the law of commerce, the law of war. It's, it's the law that we live under still today. <clears throat> but there's, there is a higher law that's, that's not written on paper, it's written in everything that exists. It's the law of, of creation, the, 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 the true laws of physics, which again go beyond that material activity in order to extract the energy of, of others, it, it's <clears throat> so beyond the, the electricity, the energy is, we're now into the photonic age where, you know, we don't need a wire to carry electricity. We can beam energy, quantum energy, frequency. So we're, we're full on into, into that photonic age, but that's still not the end of, of the evolutionary process. We still need to progress beyond that because we're still also thinking materially, many of us. Uh, so, <clears throat> beyond the, the proton, the, the substance, the, the matter, the electron, the, the energy, electromagnetic, uh, electrical field and electrical charge, and, and, and the bonding between those atoms, and then the, the light energy, the photon, which is the, the energy in that electron, the difference between a substance forming or coming apart is, is always a quantum uh, difference in the energy. And so, so light is what moves the electrons from one orbital to another. You know, when you take an atom of zinc and you absorb blue-green light into that atom, it takes the outer electron and moves it into a further out orbital where that zinc now becomes 500% more effective at doing the things that zinc does. And the same is true for toxins. That's why the study in, in, in New Zealand where sunbathers who ate margarine versus butter, well, margarine is something that is not never been never existed in our, our our genetic beings through genetic history. It's a it's a new invention from World War II, uh, and so the margarine eaters had got 700 percent more skin cancer from from eating margarine c compared to people who ate butter and stayed out in the same sun. So so light the the effect of light depends on what's absorbing that light. Uh, so so then. There's, beyond that light is, when we receive light through our eyes, right, and now we see light, that's a different kind of quality of light, isn't it? Because the light that comes into the eye, we can measure with our instruments. The light that's, that we're seeing, the vision in our, in our brains, yeah, we have squid detectors and very subtle magnetic field detectors and, and whatnot, and, and recently, uh, they were actually able, in a, in a totally dark room, we have to exclude all that environmental light to try to control and measure the, the light of consciousness. But the light of consciousness is all that we see. And so it's critically important because what determines how our nervous system sends out electrons to run the energy of muscles and move the proton matter of our body is the, the vision, the light that we see. Okay, and so, so recently they were able to me actually measure photons of light coming off of the visual cortex of the brain when the subject would visualize light. So there's, there's real light, but it's working at a more, ever more subtle level. Like going from matter to energy to light is more and more subtle. Like electrons have a little bit of mass. They're, they're a little bit material, more so than photons. photons you know, they, they, they quantize into a photon, but they can also just be light energy that's, that's, that's a waveform. 
you know, when that light comes from the star, it's, it's just a wave until we see it. We create the quantum. Uh, just like in quantum physics in, in the laboratory, they say it's, you know, the, the observer is part of, part of the process. The observer creates the quantization. And so there's even the question, well, what, what, is, are, what is the observer? Is it just scientists? Are they the only observers? No. <laughs> but, but they are. They can observe that observer effect. That yes, the, the mind, the consciousness of the observer is creating the quantization, is pinning down that, that energy and saying, right there, I see it right there. Before it's seen, it's potentially everywhere. Just like the future is potentially, we can go right or left. We can go over the mountain or go under it. We can go around it to the right or the left. We have, we have choice, there's possibility. So that field of possibility also exists physically in the, in the present, in the now. And that's, that's the fundamental essence of the spirit body that holds that consciousness. Consciousness can't exist in a field of randomness. It's, not, it's non-random. Consciousness is organized. It's structured. When we see the world, we're seeing an image created in the likeness of that world. You know, it's how, it's, it's, it's how the senses are true and functional is that they give us a, a, real, <clears throat> a real reflection of what's actually out there. Now we project it back out there. And how do we do that? Well, that's through the spirit. So, so the consciousness through light and, and sound, through hearing, through light and sound and vibration, you know, touch is like sound, it's that kind of vibration. And, and, uh, and these two are able to transduce in, into each other in the human body. You know, both of them are carried into the brain through the same kinds of electromagnetic signals through the nerves. Uh, and even in our connective tissues, we know that, that the, uh, the, the connective tissue structure, like the, uh, the collagen fibers, are piezoelectric, which means if a sound vibration compression wave travels into the body, whether it's sound, whether it's impact, whether it's touch, that waveform is also transduced, changed into an electromagnetic frequency as well. And so within, within the consciousness, it's all waveform. It's, it's frequencies of sound and light. That's what we experience. That's what our consciousness is. And that can only be held in, it can only be experienced in a, a field, a coherent field. In other words, if, if, uh, if we picture a gas as being random move, randomly moving particles, is there, is there, is there consciousness? There's no form, to, there's just randomness, right? It's like a static screen on a television set. Oh, no, there's no picture there. But when the picture gets organized, so that when that electron sweeps past that one spot, each time it sweeps past that spot on the picture, it, makes a pixel of that picture or the next pixel of the sequence of pictures, now it's structured in time and space and we have an experience of it. So the same is true in the body. We have consciousness only when our cell membrane is, is coherently structured. When it's not coherent, we're unconscious. We're, we're under anesthesia. Anesthesia has that effect or we're, we're uh, having an out-of-body experience. Maybe the brain is flatlined and, and we're still having an out-of-body experience. There's, there's proven cases of that. So we know, we know for a fact, see, it only takes that one proven experience to, to rule out a whole theory. The whole theory that's, that's believed, uh, belief is another thing. We, we operate based on belief. Culture is based on what we believe. But those beliefs are not necessarily true. And when our action is based on, on truth, <laughs> then we create damage to ourselves and to others and to our environment. So it's proven that, that an out-of-body experience can be veridical, can be true, even when the brain is flatlined. So, so the actual consciousness is not dependent on coherence of the brain or the brain state. Now, an in-body experience, yes, is dependent on the spirit being present in the, in the brain and on the state of the brain being in a coherent state so that you know there's no uh, fluoride and chloride residues of anest anesthetics that are disrupting the, that coherence of the cell membrane. This latest perspective of, of structure, function, energy, 
information or consciousness, you know, information, the perspective from, from the material world, you know, we're coming from structure. Yeah, the structure has certain function. It's in a, this coherent organism. It's not just random, you know, blocks, bits of the universe, you know, hitting into each other through mechanical forces. Yes? Structure, function, function energy, energy, information, and consciousness? Information or information and consciousness, depending on which way you're looking at it. So, in, so from that's what I was saying. From the from the materialist view, from the materialist view, we can say, okay, we have we have structure. Yeah, okay, we're materialists. Of course, we have structure. We believe in that, you know. And the quantum physicists say, well, the closer I look, actually, there's there. nothing in there. It's mostly space. Look in the universe. It's like that. It's mostly space. And then there's the sun. But if we look at the sun, then there's a couple atoms. We look in between those atoms, mostly space. We look inside an atom. Oh, it's mostly space. And we look inside the nucleus, and it's mostly space, and there's, there's nothing there. It's all energy, frequency, vibration, but standing waves. So it has coherence. Oh, it's a form of consciousness. It remembers. It has, has rules. It has its own law. It has, it's self-organizing. The universe is self-organizing. Oh, the sun organizes its, its roundness, its light, its field, its you know, emissions, its rotation, it's cycles, 11-year cycles, sunspots, it's all organized and structured according to its own principles, uh, you know, on its scale of things. But that's, many of those principles are, are scalable. If we look at plasma, it's scalable over at least 16 orders of mag magnitude. That's huge. That's from the stars to our, inside our body. And, and we look at the shapes and they're the same. We look at the shapes in the cosmos and what they see as dark matter, which is kind of leading toward same shape as the neurons in our brain, or the or the the, the fungal uh, rhizomes in in the uh, mycelia in the soil that are the consciousness in the soil. According to the the environmental biologists, they say, well, that's the consciousness in the soil that determines which plant's going to be fed and grow, and which one has to die now. And it's like, oh, there's there's the brain in in the in the environment. That's the fungus. We look at 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 the history, at our genetic history, and we say. Okay, we evolved, animals evolved ultimately, our original ancestor was a fungus. Oh, we're that, <laughs> you know? But evolved now with this animal body to move around in space. Oh, interesting. So we're part of that intelligence structure and our neurons show it. And our, if we look at live blood cell analysis and, and the, the healers and doctors and researchers who've, who've looked at that in, in many parallel uh, uh, lines of research, because it, these are lines of research that aren't accepted into mainstream because they always kill the blood with dyes and say anything that looks, you know, they, uh, not like a human cell is, you know, it's, oh, that's an artifact. They don't watch it grow and like the other, like the, the living the, the live blood biologists and, and physicians who, who say, oh, that's a mucoracemosis. If we watch that for 24 hours, it's going to grow out. And you can see that, you know, the higher forms come out as the, the condition of the blood deteriorates. It's going into the tree productive cycle. But it's, but it's a symbiont. It's part of who we are. Just like part of who we are is mitochondria. Well, they're bacteria. They're not human. They're in all the animals. There, you know, we and each of us has our own genetics of that, but it's and it's from it's different entirely in its inheritance from our human genetics, which is half mother, half father. The mitochondria is all mother; it's all maternal. So if if we look at the big picture and say, well, who we really are is the mitochondria that's developed this, you know, their bacteria that's symbiotic with these fungi that got together and made this this spaceship that can move around in the environment and therefore survive and thrive and, and be part of, of a living complex organism that is the universe, then, you know, it's really, in a way, more who we are than the human. The human element is sort of a, a, a later adaptation, but more core and central to who we are is ultimately the fungus. The fungus came first, but the bacteria came later and supplied enough energy to, by, you know, by either breaking down plant matter or animal, animal matter that fed on plant matter, or as we now are saying and, and realizing from the science that we also can live directly on light energy, 
on infrared and ultraviolet light energy from the sun, from the environment, from a different kind of light environment historically through most of, of history, very likely, where there was probably much more infrared. And so, uh, okay, so, so again, from the, from the materialist perspective, we start with the, the matter, the structure, and we say, okay, it has uh, a function. It's, you know, we re recognize that this is an organism that has survived through, you know, through uh, genetic, through competition and, you know, the survival of the fittest and all that, which that's the materialist view. And that's a part of what's happening, but there's also, we're going to come from the other perspective and, and, and look at all the science and start to see that, oh, but heck, we, we actually reprogram our, our DNA within our lifetime now. That's, that's now proven. We know that our genetics change. I mean, uh, bacteria share genes. They, you know, one, one develops resistance to an antibiotic and it can give it off to another species. So there's interspecies sharing of DNA. DNA is not the definition of who we are. It's our library that we're carrying with us. It's the, our possibilities from the past that we can call on. It's a long history. You know, my, my, my father, my mother, my father's father and mother, my, my mother's father and mother, and then, and then my mitochondria, which are from my mother's 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 mother. C completely different line in, in the, the, the human versus the, the mitochondrial uh, inheritance. So, so, again, the structure has a function. It's not a random not randomness, and we know that that that, that uh, the microevolution of of change of uh, you know within the species is not random either. The, yes, there are random genetic mutations, and yes, those could potentially create a beneficial mutation that would be positively selected for. In other words, you know, uh, a cosmic ray comes from the sun and damages a gene in your mother. And you inherit that gene, and the damage, by chance, you've won the lottery, it happens to be the million dollar prize, and you're you know, more beautiful, more functional, happier, you know, you're, you're a better person than anybody else around, and so you have more babies. That, that's, you know, that's, the, that's the limitation, that's as far as the thinking goes in conventional the conventionally held, widely held view. So, what is what is the what is the actual physical record show? It shows punctuated equilibrium. It shows not much change for long periods of time. The environment is stable, and and genetic expression is stable. Yeah, okay. There's 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 some of these randomly induced changes, relatively random. Maybe they're random changes happening. Not a big deal. The big deal happens when all of a sudden the climate, the geology, the species, everything changes radically at this point in the stratigraphy, in, in the rocks. In this, there's a discontinuity in the rock layer. There's a bunch of iridium, which means that probably came from space is, is the, the interpretation. There was, oh, there was meteorite, meteorites that came in as the, the classic interpretation, but it could come in through Birkeland currents is, is our interpretation. It could be one or the other, or it could be both because Birkeland currents can carry matter in, too, and, and eject matter. We're still getting, we're still getting uh, meteorites from, from Mars coming into the Earth. Well, how did they get off of Mars? <laughs> <laughs> that big scar on there. That was a, a lightning bolt from the heavens, a, a Birkeland current of discharge, like a light, lightning strike, but, but however many millions of times more powerful or billions of times more powerful. I, I, I don't know. We'd have to ask the uh, electrical engineers and and, uh, and uh, electric universe uh, physicists to uh, give us an estimate of that. But huge, huge, huge. So these are the the energy discharges that that in essence define define the galactic structure. We have we have galaxies mostly with two or three, usually two. Uh, two arms, so these spiral arms. Those spiral arms are the energy. OK, 
Okay, the structure is the, the stars, right? Stars and planets and gas, uh, cl nebula, clouds of dust and gas. Well, where does the dust come from? Well, that comes from these discharges, <laughs> blasting matter out of the planets. Like we're seeing now with, with the, not only, we know asteroids are rocky, like there's a whole asteroid belt beyond Mars that, that looks, always looked to me like that probably used to be a planet. You know, it's, it's planetary matter that's all blasted into, into pieces. So it's a planet that was blown, blown up. It, 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 had, it went through uh, electric discharge that exceeded its capacity to maintain stability. And Mars was close. Mars has that huge scar across it. It's got about five, six miles of material removed from one hemisphere and added to the other hemisphere. Uh, yeah. so, <clears throat> so we can go to all, all kinds of, of evidence in the cosmology that, that fits with the biological view as well. That again, we, we have we have a very interesting DNA, a un, unique. There, there's there's something called ALU DNA that we have about five percent of our DNA in this ALU structure. Now that's not it's unique that, to have that much. There's there are a couple other species, other primates that have some of this uh, alien ALU DNA, alien in that it doesn't come from any other uh, uh, life source here on planet Earth. So it appears more likely, uh, in, at least in our view, that rather than being a random, uh, a random evolution of, of some fantastic combination of, of, uh, of x-rays from the sun that, that hit some human being and created this, this functional DNA structure that has the ability to transform the rest of the DNA and rewire our DNA within our lifetime like more effectively than other species can do that that just it, it's more likely it came from another part of the cosmos carried here as you know the the, the, the cosmologists have have looked at, at the laboratory research and, and whatnot and 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 identified that 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 the spores of uh, fungi, which again is our ancestral DNA, of the human DNA, uh, is uh, able to withstand space travel. And then there may be other life forms that can too. And with, with the consideration of, of these uh, discharge tubes of, of what's called Birkeland currents, that that could, uh, in, in our theory, that could very well help to speed up the transmission and you know, reduce the amount of time of exposure to conditions in space and also alter those conditions tremendously to where that DNA could survive the, the travel from one star system to another. Uh, <clears throat> so, so that's part of the theory. Where do the Birkeland, where and how or do the Birkeland currents affect or play into human healing? Do they? Birkeland currents are the movement of electricity through a plasma, through a charged, ionized medium. And, and in, in, in my definition, in our definition, that will include the plasma of the, of the living being as well as the plasma of the cosmos. And so, yes, Birkeland currents move through the body and we, and, and we call them chi. We call it the energy of the meridians. And that energy, the meridian is a fixed pathway, but the chi doesn't follow that fixed pathway always. It can, the chi can, can move. It's, it's like an octopus within, here's the, the structure. It's, it's fixed in a sense, you know, if the body's not moving, the structure is fixed in space. But the energy can go, if, if you put your hands out and you close your eyes and you think of sending all of your energy down your right index finger and projecting that out into space, at uh, another person's pancreas and healing it, sending healing energy out there. There's, a, there's actually a change in the flow of energy. You can't think about your feet and your toes, think about the big toe on your right foot. You can't do that without affecting the flow of chi in the liver meridian, the pancreas meridian, and that affects the organ. And you know, so, so it's interactive, it's dynamic. And so uh, we use that diagnostically to measure where the energy is flowing and not flowing and how it's coordinating, which, 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 which uh, meridians are on the same 
uh, Brooklyn Current, the same circuit breaker, I'll call it, uh, and, and what medicines will create a, sen uh, create a spaciousness, a coherence, an evenness in the flow, where now the energy's flowing nicely and smoothly. It's like, oh, no traffic jams. Oh, everything's flowing good. Well, that's when things get done. That's when healing happens faster, when there's coherence. It's when consciousness happens. Consciousness happens. It's when our spirit can grow, can actually build itself, build our immortal body, our spaceship that, can, that transcends the physical body, that has the outer body experience or the, the, the near-death experience or the afterlife experience is dependent on that physical structure made of what I'm going to call dark matter that's different than the dark matter that's being searched for in high energy physics. In high energy physics, I believe they're looking in the wrong direction, misdirected by the assumption that was made, you know, uh, with the last 150 years of, of physics and cosmology, the mainstream, not, not the electrical engineers or the, or the plasma physicists. I mean, there's, there's Nobel Prize winning physicists who don't make this mistake, but they're not being listened to. We're listening to them. And, and so the mistake was, you know, like, for example, Einstein looking at the universe and saying, well, I wonder, you know, I'm going to do a thought experiment. I can't go out there and measure what's happening at that star. I can't measure the gravitational force between the star and the center of the Milky Way. I can only see its movement. I can, I can measure movement, and when they measured the movement, they said, there's not enough mass there to make it move that way. Right? There's, we need more, there needs to be more mass, if mass is the driving force. But the, nobody's asking that question, is mass the driving force? The electric universe cosmologists are asking that question, and they say, well, uh, it doesn't have to be. The movement of the, of the galaxy is, is perfectly fine if we explain it as a movement of a plasmoid. A plasma moves exactly that way on, on the scale, on the, on the huge scale of the galaxy compared to us. It's small compared to the universe, but it's big compared to us. On that big scale, it's moving just right. The timeline for the space, the time-space relationship is exactly what we see in the laboratory. We can create a little plasma the plasmoid, and get it to rotate, and in a fraction of a second, a very small fraction of a second, this little thing rotates and looks just like that. If we scale it, if we say, oh, take the, the space and make it that big, and so the time will expand to this much time, it's like, yeah, that's how it moves. It's not moving by gravitation at all, but it doesn't mean gravitation doesn't exist. You know, it's, it's something we can measure, it, it's real, but what is it? Conventional physics has no clue exactly what it is. There's theories. It's, you know, looking for, you know, a super string explanation or it's, uh, you know, there, there are multiple possible explanations. We don't know. Uh, but because gravity is approximately 38 orders of magnitude less powerful than electromagnetism, in, in our theory, we adopt the, the assumption that it's some form, some, some, in some relationship to electromagnetism. But there's evidence that it doesn't go in forward time. The modeling evidence shows that, that if, electro, if, if gravity took uh, place at the speed of, if it was a force that was transmitted at the speed of light, if it, was, if it was exactly electromagnetic in nature as we understand electromagnetism of a forward time movement of energy, then it wouldn't work. So, but that evidence shows that it must be in real time. And again, the Russians showed that there is a transmission in real time. So, well, okay, gravity is the, the present awareness. It's all consciousness. So it's the present awareness of one material body of another. In other words, in essence, w w the way I would put it is that each proton, each electron, each, each localized angelic form each angel that's holding a place in, in time and space in the universe uh, is aware of the location of all the others. They're perfect intelligence. Now, some are closer than others, and based on that distance, there's, there's, we see the, the relative force based on the, the inverse square law, which is the same inverse square law that we see for electrical charges and how they interact. It's taken me so much time just to, to grasp 
you know, to to find to seek out and find these other other views that are are not being integrated, that are so important. Like if again, if we understand plasma, well, it's how our body works. It's where the t word came from. That oh, the plasma as as an ionized gas that we see in the universe. That the plasma physicists say is 99 plus percent of the of what exists in the universe is plasma, and that it operates like our bodies do because of these the movement of electrical charges and the the three the right hand rule of of you know of movement of an electrical charge creates a magnetic field and there's three dimensions to that of movement char electricity and magnetism and that's that's how light moves it's the, it moves and there's electricity and magnetism at right angles to each other spinning through space everything is a vort vortex every electron has a spin and the protons also have a spin, uh, and time has the spin of past, present, future, where the future affects the present. So there's a reverse time effect. It's being seen in studies on presenting slides. When there's, when there's strong emotional content, there's a physiological response that happens before the computer picks the random number through a random number generator in order to determine which slide will get randomly presented. Your body knows. Your heart, it comes from your heart, not from your brain. And there's more signals, there's more nerves going from the heart to the brain than there are from the brain to the heart. So the heart is the center of awareness of the future, of the, the spirit consciousness. I could bring that up. Is that what you're saying? Or, or there's going to be some type of difference between what I'm doing based on how I feel about it. Yeah, the the ones that where they've been able to see that of to get this, a strong enough effect, it might not show up with color because it might not be that strong of intense and emotion. It's not like, oh my god, it's that color, you know. But where the slides were like. Oh my God! It's a snake, you know, gonna bite me, or it's you know, a, a, a dead body, or it's a, somebody injured or about to be injured, something that has strong, strong emotional content of, of danger or, or just you know, yeah, something horrible. Versus, oh, it's a picture of nature. It's a flower. It's a leaf. It's a frog, you know. So they were able to to see the difference, this distinction when it's that strong. But I would propose that yeah, the information, all of it, is there. The information is there. How sensitive are we to pick it up? That depends on our coherence. If we're distracted and divided, if our attention is divided into doing five different things in here and now, and, and, and we're also hanging on to past stresses that we haven't completely let go of and, and, and cleared from our, from our presence, we're, we're carrying them with us, and we're worried about the future and not you know, open to the field of possibility and holding our vision for how we want things to be with openness for it to be to look better than we could imagine but coherent and congruent with that intention we might never know <laughs> but bottom line you're saying that there have been studies showing that our feelings have a response on a random number generator yes yes there's other studies with that but uh, it's called the pair lab uh, at, at, uh, at Princeton. Uh, it's a, a physics lab where they have random number gem generation. And for example, at 9-11, they saw a definite, you know, st statistically highly, highly significant effect in, in the random number generator. Uh, I think it was a couple minutes, or a minute and a half, something like that, before the first plane hit the first tower. So, you know, the, the the interpretation is, oh, there's a mass consciousness effect that the information is, because it's such an impact on people through their hearts, that it's having an effect on the random number generator that long ahead of time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just one example. But yes, we're, so we're, our spirit, who we are on the spirit level, so the spirit communicates forward and backward in time, it, it contains those dimensions of time. You know, our, 
our ego is only the past. If we get out of the ego and be in the present, like that's a big step up, <laughs> right? Because that's where the action is. That's where the navigation is. Now, now instead of, you know, instead of looking at the rearview mirror saying, "Whoa, that was bad. Ooh, oh, ooh, it looks like we just ran over something there." <laughs> you know, we're going like, "We're at the wheel." <laughs> like, oh, where are we? Where should we go? Where can we go? Where do I want to go? <laughs> Why am I here? What am I doing? What should I do? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> but the Spirit's already been there. Knows both of those roads. Knows where the bumps are. Sees the pothole that we could hit. Because the nature of the Spirit is these, these uh, transition minerals in the Spirit form, in what's called uh, Ormus form, or M-state mineral, or monoatomic, or forms or I, I like calling them spirit minerals. They're, they're condensates or bosine scent condensates. It all depends on who's talking about it because it's all little splinter groups looking at it from their one little point of view. But when you put it all together, you realize, oh, well, to me, that's dark matter. That's dark matter. There's dark matter everywhere. It's spirit. It's what holds everything in, in its existence. It's the, it's the uh, you know, when your body grows, how does it know to grow in that direction, to make that thing in that direction? Because there's already a field there. Well, what's holding the field? The, in our model, the, the dark matter, the, the spirit matter, holds the field. It, it, it's, it's the double, it holds the double layer, that they call it in, in, uh, in plasma physics. Every plasmoid has like a cell membrane, just like our cells. Plasma has a cell membrane that's a double layer. So even the you know the structure of it is very similar in the biology and the cosmology. So the, the these spirit minerals we know exist. There's research. There's 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 uh, the patent patents worldwide patents on them. The patent in the United States was denied not because of the science being bad. They they acknowledge that the, the science is correct. But they said, we already know about this, and you know, we're not telling anyone. <laughs> we're gonna use it for our own nefarious purposes. You know, alien spaceships with the hull made out of gold and all, all these you know, other things that are going on. Meanwhile, it's the real technology. It's the next level of our technological evolution will be superconductivity. Not just the electri electricity age, the information age, the photonic age, but the age of of spiritual technology. You know, every technology we have is really just a little little sample, a little fractal, a little image, you know, a reflection of the nature of what we actually are. You know, a cell phone can call around the planet, but in, in remote healing studies, healing intention calls around the planet too. And it doesn't need, even need the phone number. All it needs, you know, if you have the person's photograph, that's enough. How can that be? It can't be from a materialistic point of view because the person with the photograph doesn't know the name or address or the health condition, hasn't seen the MRIs of the person. They don't, you know, <laughs> they don't know, but they know that because the universe knows where every proton is. There's the, the mathematics of the proton is that there's enough Planck units, those, those little tiny uh, the, the ether that makes it up, there's as many of those inside that proton as there are protons in the, pl in, in the Hubble sphere. So that each one can know intimately, one on one, the other. It's like, oh yeah, I have my, my fractal in there. I have my ref Why are protons all identical? It's not like, oh, there's... Some are a little more proton than others, some are a little more charged than others, a little more, no, they're identical, the same mass, same charge, same, to, you know, how many decimal, however many decimal points we want to measure, it's like, that's how much it is. Because they're one, they're really one. It's one blueprint. And now it's, it's like one, one rank of angels. Proton angels, okay. They're all identical in, in nature, but unique in history. Unique in location, unique in their movement. I saw this uh, TED talk, I forgot who did it, you might have seen it, but he talks about coral, uh, 
and he uses that metaphor for like past lives and even archetypes and stuff, saying that same thing kind of that it's all one coral, but there's this little curve or nubbin of the mm -hmm. coral that says, I am the coral, but I, right. <laughs> you know, so that every single little nubbin has this kind of knowing, I am the coral, but this part sees the sun at this time of the day, and, yeah. and so they're all unique, yeah. so for yeah. it really just all, is all one. Yeah, it's the, the two, both perspectives, the duality, you know, of, of existence, that both perspectives are, are critically true. That, that, you know, as human beings, we're all one. We're all the same as each other. We're human, and we're identical in our human humanity, and we're unique in our individuality. Unless we have both of those in our, in our, active in our field, we're either separate and, and, and going to damage ourselves and each other, you know, because of our separateness. Like, oh, it's just me against the world, and I've got to have more money. I'm a Rockefeller. I'm a Carnegie. I'm a, you know, I own the banks, but I want more, you know, because there's never enough. If if I'm if I'm all there is, to am I my, I'm my own god? I'm still not godly enough. I need more, and I'll never be there because I'm separate, and I'm, that's missing. <laughs> The, the satisfaction that only comes from the unity, from, from serving, you know, from always collecting. It's like, oh, I'm always eating and putting on weight and I'm job of the hut. Okay, <laughs> I own this planet. <laughs> oh, good for you. <laughs> not really. It's not fun. <laughs>